Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're grateful for how you've worked in our lives. We're grateful for the times that we have experienced your forgiveness and yet your call uh, to obedience as well. I'm sure those dogs had some of that as well. So we ask you to send the Holy Spirit to guide us as we open up your words. May we see ourselves in the text. May we apply it to our lives. And as we leave this place, may we see that it's each one of our hearts that we have to rend, not somebody else's. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. You must understand, the first time I remember hearing this text, I didn't want to hear it. And I'll give you the context. I wasn't a Christian at the time. I would go to my grandparents' house on the weekends. And every morning and every evening, my grandfather would open up the Bible and he would read it. Of course, before he would ever read it in the morning, he was already up probably while it was real early reading the Bible on his own. So as we would get up in the morning, on a Saturday morning, before uh, he would get up, or before he would finish his devotions, we'd be having the TV on watching cartoons. And then he would call us to the breakfast table and he would read the Bible. And it, it always kind of rebuked us at times. And it almost seemed like the moments that he was reading those scriptures, he knew exactly what was going on in our lives at home at that point. Now, he, he must have heard stuff from my mom, I'm sure. But there were things he never heard from my mom that he would read from the scriptures and it would point the finger right at us. You know that, that word, you? Like, you know, we don't like the finger pointing at us. You, you should do this, right? It was you. And I remember one of the evenings when he read, because after he would, we would read in the evenings, we would, uh, either we would go to bed or we'd go home. If it, was a, if it was a Sunday, we'd be going home. So it must have been a Sunday because as he was reading the scripture, I decided to leave the room, which was kind of rude. I mean, if I, if I look back on it now, I think that's kind of rude. I just told him, I don't want to hear it. And I got up and I left the dining room table. I went into the living room and there was this, just this really thin wall uh, between the living room and the kitchen. And I was as far over to the right side of that living room as I could so that the, I'd have as much wall away from me as so I couldn't hear it around the corner. I didn't want to hear it. And that particular time, and I remember many times hearing certain things being read, and other times I would close my ears with my fingers, and there were times when I could hear through my fingers. I mean, like, like I'm talking to you right now. And that was only God trying to get my attention, especially when I was, when I was engaged in some bad behaviors. But that time I didn't plug my ears, and as I was leaving, I heard him reading this. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. So you have this earthquake and the darkening of the heavenly bodies. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, verse 13, as a fig tree drops its late figs, when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Some of you might have had that happen recently. Your fig tree had some figs on it and the wind came through and blew it off in the fall. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Now, my grandfather wasn't reading it as loud as I read it to you, but it, must, it might, might as well have been read that loud because it echoed in my mind. It really echoed in my mind. Who is able to stand. And I imagine myself being in the cave or in the mountains or maybe on one of those islands got swept over, right? That's what I imagine myself being as, as this text echoed in my mind. But then the question was, is there at the end of the text, who is able to stand? 
Couldn't we ask that question today? Even as Bible-believing Christians now, years later, here I am, I can still ask that question, can't you? As we look around us in the world and we see this very week, in the last few weeks, we see political strife, we see violence in the land, we see all these things happening as far as natural disasters, either on the East Coast, it's totally wet and just drenched in all kinds of things. Have anybody here ever been through a tornado before? Do you know how, you know how it feels then, right? The un, it almost feels weary. It's, it's, it's this strange, eerie feeling when you, when you see the, the, the sky turn like an aqua blue color and you see houses, their whole roofs being peeled off and all of that. Hey, that's a real hard thing to go through, to watch, and you can't do anything about it. And then the floods, where you have all these dikes and things that are just being overflown and, and, and streams that are in these, these hundred year floodplains being flooded. You find all of these things happening, and here we're on the west, well, we don't have the rain, obviously. We have the opposite. Who would have thought with the winds that come, came through here that it would have come through and wiped out almost a whole town this week? If you told me that last week, I would have said, well, it's possible, but to wipe out huge sections of paradise, who is able to stand? The question begs to be answered. And the obvious answer is, none of us. If we were left on our own, none of us would be able to stand. None of us would be able to go through all of these situations, whether it's some kind of psychological crisis or physical crisis or spiritual or emotional crisis, by ourselves, though there is some self-care we can do for ourselves, we would not be able to stand. To see a captain, a fireman, just about breaking down. Some of you might have seen that on the news yesterday. What have they seen to bring these individuals who are militaristic type individuals, tough going into these fights, what have they seen in the last week to bring them to that point? You know what they've seen. They've seen skeletons in cars. And the police officers, what they've seen. We know that by ourselves we are not able to stand. There is a breaking point for every one of us. And so I think we need to have a time of prayer for these individuals today. Our message will go through some things that we can do. But before it's all said and done, we need to pause and have prayer for them. And why don't we just do that right now? Just uh, someone next to you, or if you're by yourself, just bow your head. and Let's have some moments of silence for these individuals who are struggling to stand right now. Father, we're going to have more time as the service ends to just linger. But right now, we want to place these individuals who are not only in harm's way in your hands, but also the ones who are responding, the ones who are 
emotionally breaking down, physically not sure they can keep going because they just got done fighting one fire and now they have to respond to another. People who've lost everything. People who wish they lost everything because what's left really isn't worth going through. People who have gotten out of their vehicles and managed to survive, but maybe somebody who was running with them didn't survive. Lord, we place that whole situation in your hands. We do know that we cannot stand alone, but we're grateful we don't have to stand alone. We're grateful that you said you'll be with us always, that your eye was on the sparrow, that you caused the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And so, Lord, we know the devil has a plan to unleash as much destruction as he can, but you have a plan to unleash as much mercy and grace as you can to temper that. And so, Lord, we're asking for your intervention. We're asking for just hearts to be ministered to at this time and those who are suffering loss of life in their family or their possessions that you can guide them closer to you as they survive this. Guide us now as we continue to look at this question. And we don't want to just move on flippantly, but we want to ask you to help us to have an answer to that question today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Revelation 6 ends with the question, who is able or who can stand? And if you think that things are bad now, keep reading Revelation chapter 7. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed." And we know this isn't talking about literal Jews. We're also, we also know this isn't talking about all the 12 tribes because some are missing. So we're talking about God's people at the end of time. Who is able to stand? It's those who are sealed. It's those who are God's people. We're sealed in our foreheads. Something has changed in our minds. And then that somehow helps change the world around us. This question... Who is able to stand is an ancient question. It doesn't even belong in Revelation by itself. It belongs far before in the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2. I invite you to turn there with me because Joel 2 gives us really a framework for what we can do, if you want to look at the do list, at a time like this. Joel chapter 2, starting in verse 10. Who is able to stand was the question in Revelation chapter 7. The question in Joel is, who can endure the day of the Lord? Joel chapter 2, verse 10. And the context is, an invading army is coming after famine has taken place year after year after year. A famine typically takes place when a city is besieged and the food sources are not able to get in and the water sources are not able to get in. But this people of God back then had it happening before the invading army ever came. You had crop failure after crop failure. You had going out to the field and you're trying to get things in before an invading army comes. There's nothing to gather. There's nothing to feed your strong troops once they are even in the city, let alone facing down the army once they come to the city. Total hopelessness. And if you read the preceding verses... It talks about the invading army coming in verse 7, running like mighty men, climbing the wall like men of war. It's using locusts as a symbol. And if you look at ancient Near Eastern depictions of armies, they often use locusts to, to describe this. We have an invading physical, spiritual force coming in amongst God's people to totally devour them. And they have nothing physically to withstand it with. It says here in verse 8, they do not push one another. Everyone marches on his own column. Though they, though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They're able to dodge. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb in the houses. They enter the windows like a thief. The earth 
quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark. The stars diminish their brightness. Where have we seen that before? We just read it in Revelation, didn't we? We read about the sun. We read about the moon, the moon being going dark. We read about the heavenly bodies, this, this something happening. A darkness comes over the land. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. That's God. Verse 11. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Same question, in essence, deep down in its very principle as Revelation. Who is able to stand as the four winds are let loose? And the four winds, if you look at, and I read in my scripture reading this morning, Jeremiah 49 is talking about the invading armies. In fact, Jeremiah 49 was talking about the winds being let loose on Elam, which would be the neighbor to Babylon, and Babylon was going to come and invade them. We typically think four winds is you know, strife and fighting and all that, and that's true. But it's especially true of an invading army, and that's exactly what Joel's generation was facing. The same invading army that Revelation talked about of Babylon was now invading them, and the question came, who can endure? The question was way down in time, closer to us in Revelation, who is able to stand? Same question. And the same answer is, no one. If you were one of the mighty men that were trained from a very young age to be the warrior, and you had no food, very little water, what good was that training? You're done. If you were one of the commanders of those mighty men, and you had no provisions, and you traded off your weapons for any provisions from neighboring areas, and now you, you, you have weapons, but your men are famished, what good is your army? No one is able to stand at that time. Regardless of their training, regardless of their intentions, regardless of whatever's happened in their past, and so Joel comes with a message, a message of hope. And the message is in his own name, Joel. The Lord is God. Present tense. He is God when your troops with all that training have no food to eat. He is God when an invading army is coming into your land and threatening your way of worship and threatening your very existence. He is God when you have disasters and fires. Read the preceding verses. Fires in the land, trees being burned down, everything taking place. He is God. Joel. And with all that said, the question comes, just like in Revelation, the heavenly bodies being darkened, with the question at the end, who can endure it? And then Joel switches, just like Revelation switched and gave you another view, which was 144,000 and the four winds, them being able to get through the four winds. Joel switches and says, Now, therefore, down here in verse 12, Now, therefore, says the Lord, Who can stand? Who can endure? Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. This is what we call a structure in some of the Hebrew writings. Imagine you're in a Bedouin society or a traveling society, and most of your religious upbringing is through stories. It's, it's through telling of the faith. Before things are written down, before Moses wrote them, wrote them all down, how, how did the stories get passed down from Adam all the way down? It was through stories. And oftentimes, the way of telling the story in that type of setting was to build up to a point, either like the chiastic structure, like a mountaintop, or tell the story and end it with the main point. And so we have all of these different structures in these Hebrew writings. And here we find verse 12, verse 13, verse 14 builds you up to the main point. Kind of like Jesus did with the rich man and Lazarus. You're reading the rich man and Lazarus, and you're thinking, wow, Jesus, you really chose a strange story there. And then you get all the way down to the end, and he goes, wham, there's the main point. You see that with several of his parables. Even the prodigal son, you, we like to look at all the details allegorically, but you get down to the end, and boom, there's the main point. That's how Jesus taught. That's how these people wrote. That's just how they thought. And so 12, 13, and 14, you say, well, turn to me with all your heart, they can, I can stand if I turn to you with all my heart? Yes, but how do you get to that point where you're giving your all to him? Begs the question to keep on going, doesn't it? And so, turn to me with all your heart. Not on a part-time basis or a leftover of leftover basis where we get done with 
this and then we could do this and then eventually, okay, Lord, I got a little time for you. Or I'm working six days a week, but I'm giving you the seventh day. No, that's not enough. That's part time. I mean, we talk about reverence and different things at times in church, and really, reverence and obedience and all of that is a seven day thing. You can't just address a symptom of it, you got to address the whole reality that someone needs to be living in the presence of God. And so, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and, pro- and mourning. What, what would be the difference if they turned with part of their heart and did all of that? It'd be no good. It's like in Isaiah 58. You, you, you made yourself look like you're fasting, but, but then you didn't do these other things. It was worthless to God. Turn to me with all your heart, not half-heartedness or no-heartedness or part-timeness. The only way to stand is to give God all your heart. Then you say, well, how can that happen? Next verse, rend your heart. Notice the heart again. And not your garments. Rip your heart. Tear your heart. A tear means that in order for it to continue, it has to be what? Mended. has to be healed. So this implies we can turn to God with all our heart if we allow our hearts to be broken, if we allow our hearts to be torn, if we allow our hearts to then be healed. See the progression? It's backwards. You can't give him your all and say you're giving him your all and then and come to church and clock in and clock out and think that's enough. You can't say, well, okay, God, I'm going to give you my tithes and offerings, but then I'm not going to give you these other things I have. You can't just have a part-time thing. That's with all our heart. But also this says here, rend your heart means don't just wear the garment that's rent. Be the garment that's rent. Imagine someone is mourning, and in our society we wear black, Right? Someone's wearing black, and so they're mourning. But what if they're wearing black and they're not mourning? So we have something outward that God is saying it's not enough to outwardly say you believe something. It's got to be inward. No outward turning or formality. That will not get us to be able to stand at the end. To come in and out, to leave this place and just come back in next week and clock in again and here I am preaching again, right? Or you're preaching or or you're teaching. That's not enough. It has to change us inside. And I think to myself, because I'm really reading this for myself, what's breaking my heart right now? What's truly rending my heart right now? If it's nothing, there's a problem, isn't there? Because there are many people going to hell right now. If you don't like that word, use Hades in the Greek. Many people going to Christless graves right now in North America and around the world. Many people facing persecution right now around the world and, yes, in the United States. I was one of the, you, could, you could be one of those if you went to public school and you believed in Jesus and you tried to share Jesus. That happens. Is my heart being rent or rended or torn for God? Well, what if it's not? Well, then the next verse is for all of us. And if that happens to you, if that happens at some point in a Christian experience where your heart is not being torn, go to the next verse. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness. This is really the answer for the other two steps in the process. If you want to look at it as steps. You must first recognize the character of God in order to have your heart be torn the way he's describing here, be healed, and then give all your heart to what he asks you to give. That's the starting point. We want to have it straight down line, right? One, two, three. The Hebrews are saying, no, flip it over. You've got to have the character of God. Just like do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Well, I want, to, I want justice done. Well, you can't have justice really done well unless you love mercy. You can't really have mercy unless you walk humbly with your God. Try doing it the other way around. 
not walking with God and applying justice to a situation. I don't know. I never used to deal with any kinds of policies really very much until I got to California. You know, in the Midwest, yeah, I know a guy, and we'd get it done. We'd go to California, and I got policies I got to follow. And I got to be careful, because it could become the point where the policy or the the instance of justice ends up becoming more important than the person. That's difficult. But God would say, walk humbly with me, love mercy, then you can justly do something. It's the same type of thing we're talking about here. It's that law of end stress. So how can I stand? It begins by knowing the character of God. The complete character of God. Yes, we can, as he's revealed it to us. He's already told us. If you doubt that, read Exodus chapter 34. These very words about the character of God here were spoken a long time before at Mount Sinai. Moses, of course we think about the Ten Commandments, but what about Moses' humbling himself before God and asking to see God, and God says, you can't see, you can't see the backside of me. He sees the backside, and then he hears the words of God. Go home this afternoon, read Exodus 34, verse 9 and onward. You'll see it's almost the exact same, some of the things we see right here in Joel. Joel is saying, you can't rend your heart unless you know the true character of God. You can't give your all unless you know the true character of God. So what would be the point in the next verses of weeping between the altar, pointing out sin and error, calling for sacred assemblies, if I didn't first call the people to know the character of God? If I didn't first try to know the character of God? We would just be ripping our clothes, looking like we're religious, and having nothing come of it. And more than likely, it ended up becoming finger-pointing. Because they're not holier than I am, because I'm part of this fast, and they're not. So God is saying through Joel, who can endure it? The one who knows the character of God, that he is gracious and merciful. That This is the one you have to return to, which implies they had walked away from him. And if you do the research, like you can go on the internet and do this type of research, look at the ancient Near Eastern religions of the time, the false gods and all that, that they had turned to, to Baal and to the Moabite gods and all of them. They had turned to those gods. And because of turning to those gods, they had all kinds of heinous practices. Because the character of those gods was really the opposite of the character of God. You look at Mount Carmel, you have the 450 prophets of Baal. What are they doing to get their gods' attention? cutting themselves, yelling and carrying on, this whole thing, 450 of them. I mean, imagine this group here, times probably five, all yelling and shouting at your God, like you've got to shout at your God with a whole group to get his attention. And then he doesn't listen, so you've got to cut yourself because he wants to see your blood and sweat, because you've already seen your sweat, right? And this, this is the kind of God you want to serve? And the kind of God that will get rid of anybody who disagrees with you? Because you've already hunted out through the land any prophets? And Elijah thinks eventually he's the only one, but he wasn't. That's the kind of God they were worshiping. Because then we have a problem with Elijah getting rid of all those people. But then if you think about the kind of gods they were serving, it puts it into a whole new context, doesn't it? And so they're worshiping this God who requires them to shout and carry on and cut themselves. And not only that, to cut their own children and to cut people in their lives, basically sacrificing You look at the pagan gods around them, they required eventually human sacrifice at times. Temple prostitution. Fertility rites of cutting pieces of body parts off and burning them on the fire. And you think that doesn't happen today? I heard about it happening in Africa about six years ago. So it's still happening today. And so that kind of God then you would be afraid of. Because if you didn't appease that God, he's coming for your children. He's literally, Molech is eating your children. Would those type of people be able to endure? Obviously, they're not enduring, according to this text. They don't even know the character of God. They're serving a different God. And it's interesting that Elijah then mocks them and says, after them going all day long, it seems like, well, maybe you can shout louder, because he's in deep thought, or he's traveling. And the Hebrew word is, he's going to the bathroom. 
He's the kind of God that's going to go to the bathroom and ignore you. He's sitting there reading his paper or his scroll. Doesn't have time for you. That's what the Hebrew language says. So Elijah, excuse me, Joel here is really giving Elijah a message to say, turn back to God who is gracious, who is kind, who is merciful, slow to anger, not that he never does justice, but of great kindness. Otherwise, you will never be able to stand and endure. Isn't that what we need to do right now? I don't know. We've all been raised different ways. Like when I heard Revelation six years ago, when I didn't have really a spiritual insight about who God's character was, I can tell you right now, it's very fearful. I remember going home another Sunday night after he had, my grandfather read another scripture, and I've told this before, and, and I would go home that, and I would have a, a real nightmare. I would lay down and I'd go to sleep, and as I'm in that dream, it's just so hot, and I'm opening my eyes in the dream, and I'm coming up out of this magma, and here's this God who puts somebody right there to shove me back down. And every time I come back up, <gasps> and I'm taking a breath. It's like I'm being crucified over and over again. Taking a breath, and it's like sauna hot air coming down your lungs, burning you from the inside out in the dream. And I wake up sweating and carrying on. And what did I do? Oh, I repented outwardly. I got down on the ground right by my bed, and I went through all my laundry lists and said, oh, please forgive me for that. Got back in bed, went to sleep with some peace, woke up the next morning and did the same things I had already repented of, supposedly. False repentance. What he's asking for here is true repentance. True turning away from these things. And it only takes place when we recognize the character of God. Because if you read those things in Revelation without knowing that this God is merciful, that he's reached out to you over and over and over and over again, then it looks like he's putting the shotgun up to you and saying, you turn or you burn. But that's not the character of God in Scripture. It would take years later where I would get to know about Jesus, and then it was my wife who really helped me revisit hellfire with the one question, not who is able to stand, not who can endure, but with the question... How can a loving God burn people in hell forever? I knew a loving God at that point. So then how could I continue believing this false doctrine? And so Joel's saying the same thing. Turn to this God whom you can love. Turn to this God who is gracious and merciful, and then you can rend your heart, and then you can give your all for me. And so... Revelation 6 asks the question, who can stand? Revelation 7 gives you the answer. The ones with the seal, which, by the way, represents God's character in our minds. His Ten Commandments. Everything about him, even beyond what was written. Revelation 14 says, then once you recognize it's God's character and rec recognize who he is, then you follow the Lamb in Revelation chapter 14. And then... As you keep reading Revelation, you see all the messed up stuff in there. You get down to Revelation 18, and it says the world is then lightened with his glory. That's his character through us. That's the same progression Joel was talking about. Recognizing his character, then we rend our hearts and are healed, then we give our all, and that same progression is there in Revelation. And so I would pray that we would rend our hearts. The sermon title was, Rend Your Heart. That's the you pointing at you, but it's also turning at me. Rend our hearts every day. Give him, I mean, if it's his character we're supposed to be looking at, why wouldn't we spend the time with Jesus and his word? If you want to see the character of God and the glory of God, look at Jesus, because you look from Matthew onward, you're going to find a very clear picture of Jesus, Clear, which is a clear picture of the Father's character, and then you can read the rest of the Bible rightly. But instead, we pull out the magazine subscriptions and we spend lots of time reading those. Or we pull out our phones and we get absorbed into all kinds of things over there. Or we find ourselves looking at all kinds of second-hand information over there. And then God really has very little time with us. That is our Western struggle. Jeremiah, chapter after chapter, you look through Jeremiah, 
It says, God rising early. God kept rising early and the nation wouldn't get up with him. Look up the word, rising early, and find it all through Jeremiah. It's about God trying to come to them just like he did to Adam in the cool of the day, every single day, and trying to get their attention, but they would not have anything to do with him until down at the end, they go to Babylon, and then Babylon installs a governor. The governor gets killed off, and the mighty men who sang to Jeremiah, tell us the word of the Lord, and Jeremiah tells them the word of the Lord, and then what do they do? We're not going to listen to you. And Jeremiah says, the Lord tried to get you early, rising early. And so the same thing happens with us, practically speaking. We have to, maybe you're not a morning person, but at some point, shouldn't we give him a tithe of our time? 24 hours, at least two hours a day, and you say, well, that's too much for me. Come on. You all drive to work at some point, don't you? Pop a CD in. Listen to the Word of God. Listen to, listen to some songs that point you to the Word of God. Scripture songs, whatever it is. Surely that 30 minutes could, could be part of that. That lunch break. I used to have lunch breaks, and what did I carry around? The Word of God. Now you got it on your phone. There it is. There's another 30 minutes or an hour. Before you, that's an hour and a half. Then you spend a 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening. You'd if you want to like clock in, you're done. But if, if you don't clock in, you're like, I'm just getting started. It's very easy. Especially in this nice calendar-driven smartphone generation that we're in. And so as I think of God's character, wrapping it all up, who is able to stand? The good news is, you are. And so am I. If we will rend our hearts. And I'm glad I'm part of a people that has rightly understood, at least in theology, technically speaking, the character of God. Maybe not, we haven't always practiced it, but I'm grateful for this people. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're grateful that yes, there was a vision that showed individuals hiding. And the question was, who is able to stand? And the answer is those who have the seal of God, who follow the Lamb and who want to lighten the world with your glory. Lord, we want to be those people. Guide us to spend the time in individual revival and so that when we do have corporate revival meetings coming up, that you will be seen, that you will be glorified. And Lord, perhaps this idea of relenting, perhaps you'll hold back those winds of strife a little longer so more people can be saved. And if it's in your time and your will, that this land will be refreshed. And so Lord, guide us to be a fulfillment of this scripture. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with your glory. We pray this will be the case in Jesus' name.